Obviously, eventually you become president, but you have become the face of this sport to so many people. You, you're known as a listener. The sport, we lit the fuse in the early 90s, and, and this thing was, was growing. You had Dale Earnhardt maybe just a little past towards the end of his career, but Jeff Gordon was coming along, Tony St I mean, we had so many people, just a new TV package had just signed, and then we get to Daytona in 2001. And before that, and, and I, I'll go personal here for a minute, when Adam's accident happened and I was in London and had just landed and, and you called and you said that there'd been an accident and then we talked a little bit later and you said that it, he just hadn't made it. In that moment, I felt bad for you. I felt bad that you had to call me and I could not imagine the weight on your shoulders. I, I just couldn't. You know what I mean? And, and I, I don't know if it's because of the way I was raised, where we would go to the racetrack and I would be playing with kids and I would never see them again because their father would pass away on the racetrack, Friday Hassler, guys like that. Um, so it had been part of, I knew it was always there, but we raced, you know what I mean? So it was just different for me. And, and it was sad and it broke my heart, but it broke my heart for you too. So when Dale's accident happened in 2001, it opened up that wound again for me to see you have to stand up um, in front of everybody and talk about that. Press box, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. 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 Um, this is undoubtedly one of the toughest announcements that I've ever personally had to make. Uh, but after the accident and turn four at the end of the Daytona 500, uh, we've lost Dale Earnhardt. Your relationship with him was close. Y'all were friends. Is that the toughest thing or one of the toughest things you've ever had to do? Yeah. Uh, that stretch you talk about from May of 2000, we go back to New Hampshire in July and Kenny Irwin. Uh, Tony Roper in Texas in the fall of 2000 and then you come back and you start off 2001 first year of the new TV agreement and it was living up to the Daytona 500 until the last turn of the last lap and, and then our, our world changed in that moment but I think the build up to February of 01 was part of that but the bigness of Dale Sr. And I'm sure along our history, whether it's a Fireball Roberts or, or Tiny Lunn or someone, that they were significant players in those days when we lost them. But Sr. was kind of the modern face of the sport at that moment. Like you said, his legacy was established, his championships were won. Uh, the Daytona 500 and Dale Sr. had a salt and pepper history, you know, and, and the, the whole world was watching the, the development of DEI and Michael and Dale Jr. And I mean, just a, a, a storybook beginning for 2001 that just came to a halt for a moment. And between the moment of the accident and the announcement, there was a lot of dialogue and a lot of conversations that, that I'll probably just take to my grave. But there was that moment where we were sitting there and saying, well, you know, by then I think most of the industry had figured out, but we had to authenticate it and make it official. And and I got picked to do it. And, and I say, well, I use some adult words, but we just lost the biggest thing in our sport. What am I, what am I going to say? And, and Brian Prance or, or Maybe Paul Brooks or somebody said, well, that's what you say. We just lost the biggest thing in our sport today. And we went to the, the media center and made the announcement. I think I know more about what I said later on looking at it than I did at the moment of saying it uh, because it was, a, it was tough. Our prayers and wishes and our effort right now this moment is with uh, Teresa and the Earnhardt family. Richard Childress and his family, and uh, Dale Earnhardt Incorporated. But I'll have Dr. Bohannon take it from here for right now. After that, I know how we felt. 
walking back into the garage area the next week because you got to go back seven days later. Yeah. And I, I believe five and six years later, that absence was still there. Now, the fans may have gotten to a different place, but we talk about Dale Sr. being a leader and being that liaison a little bit. NASCAR's got all kind of new things happening. It's growing. It's uh, just uh, exciting to see what may come along next. And I want to be around to, to be a part of it and, and, and help out if I can. In that garage area, we were lost boys at that point in time. Did, did y'all feel that? Yes. Yeah. And, and Bill Jr. and Jim Prince and I talked about that, the fact that we recognized the reliance that we, as a regulator of the sport, had through his voice. You know, we, we couldn't tap the next Dale Sr. on the shoulder and say, you're it. It needed to be organic out of the garage area. And so we were kind of more or less settling in to see who that would be. You know, Gordon wasn't ready to accept it, although people said you should and you need to. But Rusty Wallace and Dale Jarrett, Bobby Labonte, and those individuals banded together to do it as a group as instead of an individual until Gordon was kind of ready to, to be that voice. But I'd, I'd have to tell you, and it's probably because of my relationship or my age or, or my, my career, there's not been another one as strategic and as pragmatic as Dale Sr. since then. I think we felt it in the garage area as drivers because drivers have a weird way of compartmentalizing things. Well, this is why it happened. And I don't do that, so it'll never happen. But he wasn't just somebody else. So you couldn't compartmentalize it. If I go back and look at those races right after that, they were different races. Everybody was just different. There was a different approach. We, we were different. Yeah, there was a different, there was just a more cautious approach. Yeah. I, 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 I'll say that. No, we, we, we turned the wick up on the R&D Center. Jim and Bill jumped in with the resources to, to grow a, a safer effort. Wasn't too long after that, if you remember, we did away with racing back to the flag. But I think the whole industry looked at things a lot differently then uh, after, after that moment. We talk about that part of it. Now we've, we jump forward. Now we have fan council, driver council, RTA, the concessionaires are getting ready to form a council. No, just kidding. <laughs> but you, you know what? We have we have so many. We, we have, have a lot of voices. A lot of voices. Yeah. A lot of voices. Um, out of those voices, how how do you guys differentiate between the white noise? It, it, so so the, the the moment or what gets us to the councils is the understanding that the, the, the size and the responsibility and what's at stake in the sport is on everybody. You know, we're the rule maker and inspectors and all that stuff and everything, and, but we're also stewards of the sport. So I think it was on us to figure out what tools we use to be good stewards of the sport. And the, the drivers have their opinion. They're all unique. <laughs> the, sure. uh, the, the tracks, obviously are a big stakeholder in this sport. You have to have race cars and you have to have race tracks, which leads us to the team owners. They gotta be viable. And now, you know, with the, the, the advent of the broadcast relationships, that's a critical stakeholder. And so there was no single way to address the era that we could sit on the back of the hauler and talk to Dale Sr. or to Robert Yates or the Keen. There was no way to replace that. You, you know, you to, that just wasn't going to happen. So we believed that the best way to do that was to form the different councils. So the way we do it today, would that have worked in 1980? Because the way we did it in 1980, I believe in my heart, would not work today. No. I, I think every stair step serves its purpose. The speeds are getting faster, the cars are pushed to the ragged edge, so to speak. And anything that we can do to make it a safer sport, then naturally we're going to do it. I love to sit around and talk about the 80s and the 90s because I wouldn't trade being part of that era for anything in the world. I, you know, I just, I consider myself a tremendously lucky individual to have been where I was through that era of NASCAR because I love this sport. But it's only fun to talk about. You cannot recreate it. You for can't, sure. You can't go back and do it like we used to. Oh, I remember. Well, you can remember all you want to, but that's not the way it's going to get accomplished today. So every step we take along the way is toward the future of the sport. So, no, you, you can't go back to 1985 and expect to be able to do that today. 
And in 1985, I don't think anybody had a crystal ball to figure out how we would be doing it today. <laughs> no, that's, that's true. Let's go, in your mind, being a part of it for 80 to 2000, 2000 to now. What are our biggest challenges for the next 20? It's being relevant to our consumer. And, and, and that's a, that's I a had problem. to learn that from somebody yeah. else. That's not my terminology. Yeah. My terminology is I, I still like going to short tracks. I was in New Smyrna Saturday night watching a kid of a friend of mine race. Yeah. Skinner was racing. Uh, Ernie Irvin's son was racing. Rick Wilson's son was there racing. Trevor Bain's little brother was down there racing. And I, I, got, a, I got as much enjoyment standing there at the fence watching those guys race down there. And that's the energy of our sport. Now, we've grown and we're going through a major shift right now that I know firsthand that Jim France, Lisa Kennedy, Ben Kennedy, that family, that entire family are anxious to figure out the nuances along with our major stakeholders. Jim France had a great line because somebody from our marketing side said, well, we got to capture the 18 and the 25 year old because our, our heart is around 45 to 55. And Jim said, well, we've been talking about this long enough to where the 18 olds are now 45 years old. So give me a better answer than that. <laughs> but, but it's finding that recipe that, that sustains all of that. And then what you have to have along the way is a guy like Kyle Busch that pushes the same buttons to race fans that Tony Stewart pushed. Kyle Busch walked over to the 22 car and threw a haymaker that landed on Joey Logano's chin. Or a guy like Chase Elliott that pushes the same buttons that Dale Jr. pushed. Or who's gonna push the buttons that Jimmy Johnson pushes when Jimmy decides to. And so our sport is like any other sport. It relies on the character and the personalities of the athletes. And, and we've seen this transition before, and we're in it right now. We'll, we'll, we'll find the answers to it. I believe soon we'll find who the fans think, i got to watch this race because I want to see how so-and-so does today. I'm going to ask you one more question here about Tony. We had Tony on, and Tony, in my mind, instantly, I went to a place of, of Bill France Jr. And, and Dale and their relationship. Tony credits you with a ton of who he is today. He kind of took his, took his world and made it like a pizza. And he's like, here I am as a driver, here I am as an owner, here I am as a track owner, you know what I mean? And he said that he had leaned on you a lot to ask questions about all of your experience. Your relationship with him, what's it like? Well, first of all, if, if, if somebody said that you get credit for Tony Stewart being who he is, <laughs> I, I hope it's the good Tony. <laughs> it is the good Tony. But, but no, I, uh, so it, it's, it's, it's unique. And I really enjoyed the relationships with a lot of different people in the garage area. Uh, but Tony is probably one of the most unique relationships because it, it, it kind of began with dealing with him on tough issues that he put himself in and, and dealing with his personality as who he is. Hey, knock it off. But from those conversations, it's easy to see for me a soul in there that is really simple and, and trustworthy and loyal. And from that, we just happened to establish a relationship over the years that uh, we have a good time together socially. You know, he's, I could sit there and talk to him for hours, just me and him, and we could talk about really nothing, but we just kind of end up on the same page. And I don't know how to explain it because, you know, since Dale Sr., I purposely don't get close to, to drivers anymore. Uh, but Tony was one I couldn't help but. Uh, I, I laugh at him sometimes. I said, I, you, you know, you're just like another AJ I know from another era. I mean, he's he's a spitting image of AJ Foyt when it comes to his thinking, you know. But he he lands in a spot that's good for himself and everybody else around him. At the end of the day, but I just he's a he's a special character.
Hey, NASCAR fans. Thanks for checking out the NBC Sports YouTube channel. Make sure you hit subscribe below for the latest NASCAR news, race highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.